Oh, thank you for such a warm welcome to the National Army Museum. Um, it really is both an honour and a privilege to speak here this afternoon, um, particularly given that this is the first year of the centenary of the First World War. My talk um, today focuses on Passchendaele, and of course, as many of you are aware, the mere mention of the word Passchendaele conjures up images around the futility of war, bungling generalship and mud. It is a name widely and misleadingly given to the Third Battle of Ypres, and it continues to dominate public perceptions of the First World War to this day. In his war memoirs, Britain's former wartime Prime Minister David Lloyd George devoted 27 pages to the successful Hundred Days Offensive of 1918. He devoted over 100 pages to Third Ypres. This is a campaign that has been fought and continues to be fought through the medium of print. Now my talk this afternoon um, will focus on just one day of the Third Eve campaign, and that's the First Battle of Passchendaele on the 12th of October, 1917. And it will focus on the performance of just one formation, the 9th Australian Infantry Brigade. So to give you a um, running order for the talk this afternoon, first off, I'd like to talk about the 9th Brigade itself, who they were, when they arrived, what they did, before then providing some, what I think is important, strategic context to 1st Passchendaele. Um, I think it is important to contextualise this operation um, with preceding battles. And then, if you'll excuse the pun, I want to take you through a bit of a blow-by-blow -blow account of the battle itself, just kind of highlighting some of the key personalities and the key actions on that day before then going on to examine some of the factors that um, affected 9th Brigade's performance with a particular focus on its command and control systems. So to talk about the 9th Brigade first. They were formed in late 1915, early 1916, and uh, constituted the 33rd, 34th, 35th and 36th Battalions. And the Brigade had a very distinct regional identity in a way, it's quite similar to um, our own PALS battalions in the UK. The 33rd Battalion was drawn from the New England district, largely from Armadale, um, and they were known as New England's own. So you're kind of getting the resonance here with our PALS battalions. The 34th Battalion Maitland Zone were largely drawn from Maitland, just here, known as Maitland Zone. 35th Battalion were drawn from Newcastle, but also from the wider Hunter region, and they were known as Newcastle's own. And what's important, um, I suppose, with the 35th Battalion is that there was a high proportion of miners within that battalion as well, so it lent a social dimension alongside its regional affinity. The 36th Battalion, however, were recruited somewhat differently. They were known as Carmichael's Thousand, the battalion was recruited from local rifle clubs in New South Wales at the insistence of Ambrose Campbell Carmichael, who was the Minister for Public Information in the New South Wales Government. And Carmichael himself um, had the courage of his convictions and enlisted in the 36th, serving as a captain at the sprightly age of 50. The Knights Brigade arrives in England in, on Salisbury Plain in July 1916 and it forms part of the 3rd Australian Division, who are commanded by Sir John Monash. And they're held up, and still held up, to be one of the most highly trained, tactically astute divisions in the Australian Imperial Force. After four months of intensive training on Salisbury Plain, drawing on the lessons of the Somme campaign, utilising the most up-to-date tactical doctrine, the division arrives in the trenches in November 1916. Brigadier General Alexander Jobson initially commands the brigade from its formation until August 1917, when he relinquishes command of the formation. In actual fact, Monash invites him to resign his command of this formation. And according to Charles Bean, the Australian official historian, Jobson was constitutionally incapable of facing battle conditions. Jobson is replaced by Brigadier General Charles Rosenthal, a former artillery officer, and Rosenthal commands the 9th Brigade until his promotion to command the 2nd Australian Division in May 1918. 
I think it's fair to say that the 9th Brigade had quite limited operational experience prior to 1st Passchendaele. It had been in France less than a year when it attacked on the 12th of October 1917. It had undertaken a large raid near Hoopleen, oh, yeah, near Hoopleen, near Armentieres in early 1917. However, its real baptism of fire didn't come until the Battle of Messines in June 1917. And I think it's important to point out at this point that it performed well in both of these operations. So where does First Passchendaele fit um, within the wider Third Eep campaign? Well, I, it feels a bit like um, teaching grandma to suck eggs, because I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this information, but for those of you who are not, the Third Eep campaign began on the 31st of July, 1917, with clear strategic goals. Its aim was to drive the German army off the ridges east of Eep, so here, um, before advancing um, east, and northeast to capture the uh, key strategic railheads of um, Thoreau here and Rouleur. Um, an amphibious operation at, um, to capture Ostend up here um, was planned in conjunction with an assault from the coast at Newport. This would capture the two important channel ports, but it would also create a strategic pincer movement, forming a flank around which the Allies could attack the Germans in the rear. So this seems like eminently sensible, clear strategic goals. Responsibility for the campaign was initially granted to General Sir Hubert Goff, commander of the Fifth Army. The attacks of August 1917 had overambitious objectives and they were extremely costly. Not only were the operations hampered by atrocious rainfall, but they were typified by poor planning and inadequate preparation. By the 25th of August 1917, Haig decides to transfer operational responsibility to General Sir Herbert Plumer. Plumer and his staff at Second Army planned a series of limited objective, bite and hold operations. These were organised in great depth, they used fresh formations to leapfrog one another, and they benefit from very heavy creeping and standing barrages. Between late September and early October 1917, the battles of Menin Road, Polygon Wood and Broodsender were fought to great effect and they appeared to vindicate bite and hold as a foolproof method of combating the German defensive system. However, the dry weather of September broke after the attack on Broodsender on the 4th of October and there followed the heaviest rainfall in the region in 75 years. And the thing with this dry weather prior to the downfall is it actually masked the reality of a forward communication system that was completely inadequate and close to collapse. But in spite of this inadequacy and the torrential rain, two further assaults were agreed, forming the third phase of this campaign. The Battle of Polkapel on the 9th of October was fought by two relatively inexperienced British divisions serving in 2nd Anzac, the 49th and the 66th. The result was a costly failure. Poor preparation, poor communications and weak artillery support contributed significantly to this operation's failure. The decision to attack again three days later on the 12th of October was to gain the last section of high ground before the winter set in. Preparation time was seriously reduced to the detriment of both logistic and artillery support. In my very humble opinion, First Passchendaele was simply an operational step too far. Now what I want to do for this next section is again to kind of talk you through the battle and pull out some of these key personalities and actions. So um, I hope you can see some of the maps. I'll use the laser if not. This um, was very, the first battle of Passchendaele was very much a second ANZAC operation. Um, it operates with the New Zealand Division and the 3rd Australian Division in the front. It does have support from 1st ANZAC Corps in the form of the 12th Brigade that are drawn from the 4th Division. Um, the uh, task for the divisions on the day, New Zealand Division were to take the um, Bellevue Spur on the left here, which is kind of just running along here. The 3rd Division were to take the main Passchendaele Ridge here, and the 12th Brigade were to provide a flank guard 
for the third division. Now, I think if any of you have been across this ground, um, you'll know that this area is kind of dominated by um, three spurs that sit in kind of an E shape kind of here. Um, and basically what this means is defenders on each spur can support each other with flanking fire. And Knight's Brigade itself is subject to both reverse fire and enfilade fire throughout the operation itself. The objectives uh, for 3rd Division's attack, um, the first objective, the red line, that's an initial advance of 1,200 yards. The blue line, second objective, further 500 yards. And the green line, just beyond Passchendaele Village, is a final um, 765 yards. The total depth of attack on the 12th of October is approximately 2,500 yards. These objectives were almost double those set to the 49th and 66th divisions on the 9th of October, three days earlier. To focus down on a bit of the nitty gritty here, the axis of Knight's Brigade's assault actually runs diagonal to the axis of the ridge line. Now, if anyone's tried to kind of negotiate this, um, it generally goes against the tendency to, to follow the contour line. So basically what you get here is kind of a wedge developing where battalions start following the ridge line, which causes all kinds of contact problems with this formation here. So Knights Brigade start going up here. Um, and as we'll see later, those contact problems and communication problems are incredibly important. The taking of objectives. Um, this is typical second army um, with the way of doing things really in operations. They leapfrog battalions. So the 34th Battalion is to take the red line, 35th Battalion to pass through them, to take the blue line, and 36th Battalion to pass through both of them, to take the green line. 33rd Battalion, down here, are held um, in divisional reserve b before being passed um, to command of brigade at midday, but they were only to be used if the 10th Brigade operating in this sector gets held up. This is an incredibly contentious issue between Rosenthal and Monash. Um, it highlights a number of command and exploitation problems, uh, which I'll discuss later on in the talk. The battle itself. It commences at 5.25 in the morning on the 12th of October. The approach march and the initial stages are incredibly difficult. Not only does it take approximately four hours to traverse the one mile between Zonnebeke and Tynecott, the approach is um, hampered by enemy shelling and heavy machine gun fire. In fact, intelligence reports from 2nd Anzac suggest that the 6th and 8th Jaeger regiments, part of the 195th Division that are facing 2nd Anzac, actually have double allowances of light and heavy machine guns, and these are all employed in depth. This attack <coughs> is not a surprise to the Germans opposite. But in spite of that, the 34th Battalion do manage to take their objective at 7 in the morning, which an hour and 35 minutes after the start of the attack is pretty good going. This picture, again, it, it feels a bit strange showing this picture because it's a beautiful sunny day in Belgium and obviously it wasn't on the 12th of October 1917. But this is to provide a bit of context. So you've got Passchendaele Church in the, uh, the background there. This, this line really is, is about where the red line was. And this picture is taken on the 9th and 12th Brigade boundary. So we're looking north up the battlefield. And this position here is just um, in front of the blue line. So you get a bit of a sense as to kind of the distances that they're traversing. We have um, the 34th Battalion on the red line. So at this point, it's the 35th Battalion's turn to move through them to take the blue line. But unfortunately, the 35th Battalion are unable to do this. They can't take the blue line without assistance. They've suffered a number of heavy casualties owing to this heavy enemy shelling and machine gun fire. And it's around about this point in the battle that Clarence Jeffries wins his Victoria Cross. Now I want to kind of dial back a bit here in that Jeffries is an officer in the 34th Battalion. Um, the 34th Battalion are on their approach to the Red Line. They get held up by a German pillbox on the Passchendaele Ridge and it begins to hold up the advance. So Jeffries, using his initiative, organises a group of his men. He attacks and captures the position. He takes four guns and 35 prisoners. 
um, which is fantastic, which means that the 35th Battalion can now pass through and take the blue line. But unfortunately, their advance is held up. Um, there's a machine gun position at Tiber, the position that I highlighted earlier, and it holds up their advance. Jeffries, again, realising that it's important for him to use his initiative, um, again, mobilises a group of men. He comes out from the red line, makes for this gun position, deploys his men, rushes the, um, the emplacement, and is killed in doing so. His men manage to work around the position and take um, the prisoners, and they take the pillbox, um, but unfortunately, he is killed in doing so. And Jeffries is buried um, in Tynecourt Cemetery, and some of you may have visited his grave, and as you can see from the picture, it is one of the most visited graves probably in that cemetery. Following um, Jeffries' action, the 34th Battalion actually move up to help the 35th, reinforcing on the right, and the 36th Battalion, rather than pushing onto the green line, decide to reinforce on the left. This happens around about 10 in the morning, so by 10 in the morning, the left-hand side of the blue line is in a fairly well consolidated um, position. But the problem is it involves all three assaulting battalions, which means it's going to be very difficult for them to push on and take the final objective. And you'll also see that there's a large swathe of the blue line here that remains uncaptured and will remain uncaptured for the rest of the day. Throughout this battle, as I alluded to earlier, the Knights Brigade is subject to heavy enfilade fire, particularly on its left flank. And this comes from positions such as Crest Farm, but also from Passchendaele Village itself. And the problem with the left flank is really because the New Zealand Division, who are operating here, are unable to capture the Bellevue Spur around here. They actually get stopped in front of Bellevue Farm, which is really just kind of before all the red barbed wire. This account on screen is taken from the 40th Battalion's regimental history. The 40th Battalion were in the 10th Brigade, serving next to the New Zealanders. And I think you'll agree that it, means, it makes for very harrowing reading. And not only was enfilade fire received from the left flank, but it was also received on the right. Again, from this position, Tiber, Assyria, and also a position that's just off the screen down here called the Kyberg. And the Kyberg is a, a really a small ridge line that runs off the main Passchendaele Ridge and causes all sorts of issues um, with 9th Brigade and their advance. The 9th Brigade, unsurprisingly perhaps, are, are unable to hold on to the blue line owing to heavy fire and a loss of support on both flanks. The blue line is on a forward slope, which means that it's under direct observation from the east, but also from the south in these positions here. Divisional orders are for the blue line to be held at all costs, but this was simply impossible due to fire and heavy casualties. So the Knights Brigade decide to withdraw from the blue line between three and four o'clock in the <coughs> afternoon. They had been in this position for almost six hours, sustaining incredibly heavy casualties. Now, unfortunately, there was no chance to reconnoitre the positions behind them. They ended up withdrawing beyond the red line and actually dug in just in advance of their jump-off point. The order to withdraw <coughs> was given by Major Henry Carr, uh, officer in the 35th Battalion and a senior, the senior officer on the blue line at that time, so it was his judgment call to make. And his actions resulted in a court of inquiry to ascertain why the 9th Brigade decided to withdraw from this position. Prior to the withdrawal, as you can see from the map, they made fairly um, substantial advance of about 1,700 yards, the furthest advance on the 12th of October. <coughs> But this came at a heavy cost. They were suffering about 70% officer casualties and about 67% casualties for other ranks. So this was not um, a cheap operation. And this picture on screen is the D5 crossing and this marks the limit of the Australians' advance on the 12th of October. And the reason I put that up is to kind of show you the type of churned up terrain 
that these troops are having to attack across on the 12th of October. So that was the battle. What can we deduce then about 9th Brigade's performance in this operation? Well, in my view, past performance, particularly in Messines, suggests that the 9th Brigade was a good, steady formation. And I think this is really evidenced by the six hours it spent on the Blue Line under very heavy fire. But I do think that its performance was subject to factors, some of which were outside of its control. First, I would say, is the lack of preparation time. The Brigade had at best three days to prepare for this attack, and this detrimentally affected their artillery and logistic support. Second point, inclement weather. The rain was unseasonably heavy for this time of year. In fact, it was twice the average rainfall for October and November. This affected the state of the ground. It slowed the infantry and their ability to keep up with the artillery barrage. And of course, because of the state of the ground, it meant that the grazed fuse on the shells didn't have enough resistance to detonate, so the shells were pretty much just ploughing into the mud. Monash writes to Alec Godley, the commander of the 2nd Anzac Corps, stating that all the reasons of the failure of the attack to achieve its objectives may be summed up in the condition of the ground. The third point, depth of objectives. These were double those assigned to the 66th and 49th Divisions. For the 9th Brigade, this operation is very much a case of diminishing returns. It's attacking over churned up ground, it's not able to destroy the enemy's guns, and I think this is one of the key problems with bite and hold, particularly in this kind of um, weather. And also, I think that this operation has something of an identity crisis. The objectives suggest that it's a deliberate attack. The preparation time suggests that it's a quick attack, and I think there's a bit of a kind of mismatch there in, in the understanding of this operation, particularly at the time. The final point is command and control. Now, this is something that a brigade can exert some kind of control over. And really, as the decision to withdraw is a command decision, this is the area that I really want to pick up on for the rest of the talk this afternoon. My aim is to treat command like an onion, really. I want to peel back the layers from division down to company to really ascertain who was aware of what and potentially to deduce the weak link in the chain of command. So to start at the top, as I mentioned earlier, the commander of 3rd Division at this time is General um, Monash. He's an engineer by trade. He joins the militia in 1884 as an artillery officer, and he actually only becomes a professional soldier just before the outbreak of war. And he's given command of the 4th um, Australian Infantry Brigade. He serves um, with distinction at Gallipoli. And as a result of this, in 1916, Monash is promoted and given command of the 3rd Australian Division. And he commands this division from its inception and is able to put his own indelible mark on this formation. But he's not without his critics. Monash and his staff's performance at First Passchendaele has come under quite severe criticism, not only from contemporaries at the time, but also from historians since. Edmund Ironside, a staff officer in the 4th Canadian Division, wrote, I found Monash and Peter Jackson, Monash's GSO-1, in a dugout in the ramparts of Ypres, from which they had directed the attack, without either having been to see the ground before or after the attack, which failed disastrously. Monash's lack of personal reconnaissance for this operation has been cited as a key criticism. One historian suggests that if Monash had seen the ground, he may have viewed the likely success of this operation somewhat differently. In his report to Second Anzac after the operation, Monash wrote that time of preparation was too short to permit of adequate reconnaissance by leaders both senior and subordinate. This lack of preparation time meant that his orders were transferred verbally rather than in writing, um, discussion and conferencing were gaining ground by 1917 with the beginnings of a return to principles rather than the precise and detailed orders that typify the campaigns, um, particularly the Somme campaign and earlier. I think personally one of the problems with Monash is his tendency towards very hands-on command. He likes to micromanage his subordinates. 
even though they are incredibly competent. He was known to usurp the role of his brigadiers. He would state how they must employ their battalions. And this goes against the, the great military adage of see down two levels, command down one. And this tendency towards micromanagement would manifest itself with quite painful effect at first Passchendaele, with the example of the 33rd Battalion, who were held in divisional reserve until midday. In a message to the 9th Brigade at half 11 in the morning, Monash wrote that the 33rd Battalion will probably be available for your own use, but must not be committed without first referring to me. And this actually countered official guidance found at the top of the army that recommended the man on the spot is the best man to judge when the situation is favourable for pushing on. And higher commanders in rear must be prepared to support the man on the spot to the fullest extent. And I think when we go through and assess the different levels of command and their performance, it's important to bear this guidance in mind, particularly when we look at the next level brigade. The commander of Knight's Brigade, Charles Rosenthal, he's a former artillery officer who had previously held the position of Commander Royal Artillery in the 4th Australian Division. He had been in command of the 9th Brigade for less than two months before 1st Passchendaele. And I think it's important to note that 1st Passchendaele was Rosenthal's first operation, not only as a brigade commander, but also as an infantry commander as well. But it's quite clear from his personal diary that he takes this job pretty seriously. He um, writes how he's consulted all and sundry publications from the general staff on infantry work. So he's clearly trying to learn as much as he can before he's thrown into this operation. But I think it's important to put Rosenthal into a bit of context here. As I mentioned earlier, Alexander Jobson, his predecessor, had been forced to resign. Monash didn't believe that Jobson was capable of, and I quote, exercising strong and determined command and leadership. Monash was concerned that the brigade wasn't pulling together, units weren't doing what they were told, and this legacy is so important when assessing Rosenthal's behaviour during the operation, but also his behaviour afterwards. Rosenthal is, a quite, um, is quite candid in his diary. He confessed um, quite considerable doubts um, over the rushed nature of the preparations, and he believed that there was very little time to prepare for this. And his actual ability to affect the course of the battle itself was negligible. And this is in part due to the fact that there was no buried cable beyond brigade headquarters, which meant that runners and visual were the only methods for communicating forward of brigade. He often was unaware of the situation for many hours. And it's little wonder that in his after action report, he wrote that better results would be obtained if brigade commanders could be in personal touch with battalion commanders and thus promptly able to organise assistance where most required. Rosenthal's inability to affect the course of the battle um, is further undermined by the lack of control over the 33rd Battalion. He did not receive control until midday, by which time the battle had effectively bogged down and there was insufficient opportunity for him to employ his reserves effectively. Generally, this isn't just limited to the, to the um, first Passchendaele operation. There did seem to be a lack of consistency across the board with regards to the role of brigade commander, particularly around whether they should be going forward and leading or staying back and commanding. And this inconsistent doctrine, coupled with Monash's top-heavy micromanagement, limited Rosenthal's options substantially during this operation. It was under Rosenthal's orders that a court of inquiry was held to what he called get at the facts regarding Knight's Brigade's withdrawal from the Blue Line. The court was presided over by Lieutenant Colonel Leslie Mooreshead. Some of you might be familiar with him and his Second World War fame. It examined 19 witnesses of all ranks across all battalions, and it primarily focused on the actions of Major Henry Carr, the man responsible for giving the order to withdraw. Now, it's important to note that no other courts of inquiry were actually held within the Third Division, despite 10th Brigade also deciding to withdraw from their first line objective. 
The inqu inquiry wasn't really an exercise in trying to blame someone. It was more to highlight areas of improvement. And I think, in my opinion, Rosenthal requested this court of inquiry almost as an act of self-preservation. First Passchendaele is his first operation. It's not a particularly successful one. And I think, bearing in mind the legacy of his predecessor as well, Rosenthal wants to weed out poor performance, and he wants to put his own mark on this formation and show that he's not um, weak when it comes to weeding out poor performance. One of the key findings of the course of inquiry focused on the performance of the brigade's battalion commanders. The findings stated that commanders, and I quote, should have gone forward and personally taken hold of the situation. By this, battalion command appears to be the weak link, although I think this is really exacerbated by poor communications and also relative command inexperience in the field of battle itself. Along with a lack of buried cable back to brigade headquarters, all battalion commanders were in the same headquarters at a place called Saint House. Um, and really this picture is just to kind of show you the type of conditions. This is the road going back to brigade headquarters. So if you're a runner trying to get down that road, it's going to be pretty difficult. Conditions were cramped, they were dangerous, and as the 33rd Battalion's after action report stated, there shouldn't have been more than two COs in that headquarters. Continuous movement and a number of men going in and out of headquarters at all times often attracted the attention of enemy aircraft. Sane House was also poorly situated in a valley, which meant that battalion commanders were unable to view the battlefield as well. I think it's fair to say that battalion level was inexperienced in um, an operational sense. Lieutenant Colonel Leslie Mooreshead, the commanding officer of the 33rd Battalion, was actually quite critical of his fellow battalion commanders, and he declared in what I'm sure he thought was an off-the-record conversation with Charles Bean that although Lieutenant Colonel Milne, the commanding officer of the 36th Battalion, was a game enough CO, Major McDowell, acting CO of the 35th Battalion, and Major Fry, acting CO of the 34th Battalion, seem to have nothing of the right spirit. I'd like to focus on McDowell because he's um, Major Henry Carr, superior officer, and unlike Mooreshead, who'd commanded his formation for 18 months, John McDowell was a temporary commander. But correspondence between McDowell and Lieutenant Colonel Goddard, who was the actual commanding officer of the 35th Battalion, suggests that the former was actually pretty good. McDowell had completed the senior officer's course at Aldershot, the commandant believing that McDowell would make a good commanding officer in time, although he was inclined at times to be a little too sure of himself, but that he would benefit from a six-month appointment as 2IC. Circumstances, unfortunately, led to his appointment as temporary commander of the 35th Battalion after less than four months, and unfortunately for McDowell, first Passchendaele was his first operation as a battalion commander. McDowell, like many other commanders involved in this operation, did not have an easy time of it, and his performance was vociferously challenged by Major Henry Carr during the Court of Inquiry. Marshalling the full weight of British Army doctrine behind him, Carr believed that practical control by the 35th Battalion headquarters was not possible seeing that it was located about 2,000 yards from the firing line. Carr went on in a much more impassioned tone, stating that Major McDowell did not accompany the battalion to the deploying point, did not see the companies into position himself, nor send anyone else to do so, did not accompany the battalion over the top, and not to move forward either then or subsequently, and, as far as I can gather, did not at any time during the day of the attack go forward of the bulletproof headquarters in which he had established himself the night previously. Carr was right to challenge McDowell's perceived inaction. Battalion commanders were expected to move forward with their unit. They were expected to establish their headquarters within the vicinity of the furthest captured objective. And of course, this doctrine is correct in principle, but its applicability on the battlefield was often unfeasible and is a different matter entirely. 
I think it's fair to say that local control could have been achieved by battalion commanders going forward, but it's difficult to assess how effective this would have been in the long term, given the lack of appropriate communications. And I think communications would really mitigate against any potential effectiveness. Turning to my final level of command this afternoon, company command. 1917 was an incredibly important year for the tactical level of command. It sees the publication of SS 143 and with it a revision of platoon tactics and organisation. Tactical decentralisation renews the emphasis on devolved command and the need for company and platoon commanders to rely to an even greater extent on their own initiative. This, of course, again, is fine in principle. However, within the 9th Brigade initiative and low-level command were seriously undermined, not only by the heavy casualties they sustained, but also, again, by these incredibly poor communications. The casualty rate, as I mentioned earlier, amongst officers in the 9th Brigade was approximately 70%. And out of the 55 officers killed, 15 of these were company commanders. High officer casualties had the unfortunate effect of lessening the impact of local level command. This led to a reliance on the battalion commanders, leading to a centralisation of command back up the chain. But as I've mentioned, owing to poor communications, battalion commanders were unable to affect the course of the battle. So what you get here is the beginning of something like a command vacuum on the 12th of October. Communication, and I know I keep banging on about it, but it was a massive problem, particularly at company level. The experience of Major Giblin, an officer in the 40th Battalion in the 10th Brigade, offers a good example of this. Giblin sent a message at 8.40am informing his brigade headquarters that he did not have enough men to advance to the blue line. He had still received no reply to this message at half one in the afternoon. Captain Dixon, a company commander in the 35th Battalion, received only one message from his battalion during the course of the day. Major Henry Carr had 16 messages sent to him from the 35th Battalion. However, his decision to withdraw was, based, um, was given on his own initiative based on the fact that he hadn't received any instructions from his battalion headquarters. What's important to realise, aside from the fact that the communications were unreliable, is that Carr takes responsibility for the situation as he's experiencing it. He makes a command decision, and again, let's hark back to the guidance that's coming down from the very top of the army about deference to the man on the spot who is there witnessing what's going on. But to focus on Carr for the rest of this section, up to the point of withdrawal, Carr's work had been excellent. He had shown, and I quote, considerable courage, endurance, and good control during the advance. The Court of Inquiry, unsurprisingly, revealed that Carr's lack of reconnaissance prior to withdrawal was a grave error. But Leslie Moore said the president was sympathetic to Carr's situation, writing that, I fully appreciate Major Carr's difficulties, that he had no officers and few men, that he was under the impression that the 34th Battalion was still on the red line and consequently would show a decided feature on which the men would pull up. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case. The experience of Captain Alex Patterson, an officer in the 39th Battalion 10th Brigade, offers a very interesting contrast to Major Carr's experience of 1st Passchendaele, and one that's worth exploring. Patterson, similarly to Carr, was the only unwounded senior officer of his battalion, or in, of his brigade. Patterson, in conference with junior officers, decides to withdraw to a line just in advance of the jumping off point. Both Patterson and Carr <laughs> use their initiative, except Carr is rewarded with a court of inquiry, whilst Patterson is promoted to major and recommended for a bar to his military cross. Such are the fortunes of war. Initiative is a highly desirable trait, particularly at the tactical level of command. Second Army recognised this. They advocate that leaders must be taught to act quickly. 
However, poor communications depreciated initiative and encouraged centralization. This put commanders in the position of being obliged to act without any accurate knowledge of the situation on their flanks, in front of them, and of course, behind them. So to pull all this together, well, what I hope I've shown you this afternoon is that there's more to Passchendaele than the mud and the blood. It was a complex operation that suffered from a number of operational constraints, and owing to time, I've only been able to scratch the surface of just one of them. Although Major Carr's actions on the 12th of October 1917 countered his official, or official guidance coming down from division, they reveal an officer who used his own initiative based on the information available to him. A pamphlet for young officers published in 1917 declared that, I quote, the principal object of all tactical instruction is to train officers to act when they have no superior on the spot to refer to. It encouraged officers to ask themselves, was the officer responsible for the order in possession of the main facts as I now know them to be when he issued it? Carr knew more of the situation than his battalion or his brigade commander. His actions, I think, should therefore be commended. I don't think Major Carr's decision to withdraw in any way impacted on the brigade or the division's performance or its fighting reputation. In spite of poor preparation, poor communications, poor artillery support, faulty logistics and bad weather, the brigade performed as well as could or should be expected. To me, 1st Passchendaele was a bloody phase of the 9th Brigade's learning curve, the lessons of which would influence its more successful performance, particularly in 1918. The brigade didn't fail on the 12th of October, but it paid a heavy price for an inevitable outcome. Thank you.